I signed the documents for mine laying, once again talked with N.I., meshed Chusky and went out to the headquarters garden for a breath of fresh air. But immediately I heard an exclamation. Comrade Chief of Staff, you are urgently requested. The Commander of the Fleet. I ran into the brightly lit office. Conflot stood, leaning over the land map, laid out on a special table in the corner of the office. Seeing me, he said. The Smolny called. The front headquarters received information that the 115th and 123rd Infantry Divisions retreating from Vyborg suffered heavy losses, got surrounded, and almost without equipment and weapons in separate groups, are coming out on the shore of Coivista Bay. The fascists pressed them to the water. The exact position of the units is unknown, there is no communication. Somewhere here they must be. Vice Admiral drew a large circle with a pencil between Coivisto and Maxlati. Is it clear? The Comflot asked me. Admittedly, there was no clarity, and I was in no hurry to answer. Comflot continued. The front commander ordered to assemble both divisions in Coivisto and urgently by sea to bring them to Leningrad. This operation is entrusted to you. Is it clear now? Tribiat smiled. Yes, it is. The task is clear. The day before yesterday, Captain Second Rank Zozulia reported to me the situation in the area of the Kalian Isthmus. The task is really clear, but where are the divisions? I thought. After all, the whole coast is occupied by the fascists. What forces the enemy has there, Allah only knows. So it is possible to get into the clutches of Hitlerites alive. Where to start? Yes, by the way, said the Vice Admiral. You haven't been home after Tallinn, it seems, yet? I haven't had time. For now, we'll have to limit ourselves to a telephone conversation. I called Leningrad and told them that I was alive and well. At that time, it was probably the most important thing for us at home. I immediately made a plan of action with the Comflot. At least six or seven large transports had to be sent to Coivisto. For their direct protection at the crossing it was possible to use armoured boats and patrol boats and patrol boats of the scary detachment, which had departed from Transun to Bjorkson Strait. Finally, the whole passage was in the fire zone of our batteries of Krasnaya Gorka and Bjork Archipelago, besides the fairways passed east of our mine barriers, and were covered by ship sentries. It remained only to cover the ships from the air with fighter aviation. Thus, the provision of the transition was reliable and did not cause doubts. It was necessary to hurry with the transition of transports to the place of loading divisions. It was decided that I with the task force immediately go to Coivisto to clarify the situation. The transports would leave Leningrad when ready. The management of preparation and dispatch of transports was entrusted to my deputy, now Captain First Rank Fyodor Vladimirovich Zazulia. The difficulty was that almost all the transports that came from Tallinn required various repairs. In the headquarters called the head of the technical department of the rear of the fleet engineer Captain Second Rank, N. N. Kudinov, and the head of the Kronstadt Naval Plant Engineer Captain First Rank, B. M. Volosatov. I ask them. Can you send six, seven transports in 24 hours to Koivisto? They are silent, looking at each other. I explained that it was necessary to rescue two of our divisions, which were surrounded. Having understood the task, our engineers did everything they could. Repair of transports, scheduled for the campaign, was organised in a short period of time. On some ships the specialists finished their work already on the move at sea. What will you go on? The Conflot asked me. On a hunter, I answered. Fascist airplanes do not chase boats. Magnetic mines are not terrible for the wooden hull of the hunter, and we will watch for floating mines. We will see the surface enemy before he notices us. Comflot agreed. Early in the morning of September 1st we went to sea. As sailors say, the weather was smiling on us. Somewhere in the distance the Zuid West was subsiding, and a lazy, but still large ripples were coming from the west. Visibility was excellent, the sky with a few small clouds. Sometimes the boat, going 18 knot speed, buried the bow, and the forward-looking sailor from head to toe poured water. To watch for mines the commander of the hunter appointed the most eye and fast sailors, placing them on the sides and on the bow. 
they were replaced every hour. Having passed the boom gate, the commander of the ship played the battle alarm. All weapons were prepared for battle. Miners at the stern prepared on the signal to drop depth bombs on the Nazi submarine. Anti-aircraft gunners and artillerymen froze at the guns and machine guns. The senior officer in the position of chief of marching staff went with me Captain 2 rank Nikolai Georgievich Bogdanov, former commander of the destroyer, stocky, tightly bunched, knowledgeable man. In the Navy they say about such people a real sailor. This notion implies knowledge and experience, love for the sea, calmness and authority deserved in the team. This is how Nikolai Georgievich was known on the destroyer, so he remained everywhere, wherever fate threw him. I remember the alarming shout of the lookout. There's a mine on the course. The boat, strongly tilted, turned aside Bogdanov, raised to his eyes his combat, still destroyer binoculars. He muttered angrily. What a mine. It's a barrel. But I said to the sailors, Well done. In the sea, you have to notice everything. It's better to go around a hundred barrels than to miss one mine. Colonel M.A. Zernov, the chief of fleet communications, was coming with me. Small in stature, overweight, he was imperturbable, which helped him a lot in his hectic work. A knowledgeable specialist, an old Baltic, he enjoyed well-deserved respect in the fleet. Not reacting to any reports about mines, the colonel immediately sat down in the radio room, checking the material part and documentation of radio communication. Everything is in order, he reported to me, not without difficulty climbing out of the small radio room. Knowledgeable guys here, fifth year of service, should have been demobilized in the fall. The chief of communications loved his subordinates. I don't remember a time when he spoke ill of them. He was a wonderful educator. It is not by chance that after the war M.A. Zernov was the head of the Higher Naval School of Communications for a long time. The third officer of my marching staff was Captain 2nd Rank Ivan Nikolaevich Gantsov, the head of the Military Communications Department of the fleet. All the masters of the merchant and fishing fleets, and, first of all, the Baltic State Shipping Company with its numerous vessels, were subordinated to him in military matters. Gantsov is a colourful figure, small in stature, thin, very agile and expansive, with a lively mind he was an excellent comrade, a great patriot and expert in his work. Well, Ivan Nikolaevich, will your ships arrive on time? I asked. Gantsov became animated at once, as if he had been waiting for my question, and began to report in detail about which steamer he had no doubts, and which might let us down. After all, after such a difficult passage they must be repaired, and evil necessity demands. He sighed heavily. We passed the traverse of the Stursudden Lighthouse. The observation post responded to our call signs. It pleased us it means that the enemy has not reached here yet. We decided to go closer to the shore. It was completely empty. No people or pets could be seen near the rare houses. North of the lighthouse everything is unusually dead. The Strait of Bjorkesund is in itself unusually beautiful. Its high shores are covered with slender, bright green coniferous forest, and yellow sandy beaches stretch by the water. The village of Koivisto is situated on the low-lying shore of a horseshoe-shaped green bay. All the buildings were small and clean, with a pickaxe with a thin Gothic spire towering above them. It was high, visible from the sea for tens of miles and served us always as a good landmark. Koivisto Bay was dear to me from distant memories. In my youth I sailed as a sailor on Finnish skerries, several dozens of saint. Petersburg yachts from the smallest to large 40-ton yachts would gather in Koivista Bay in summer. From here they started their voyages along the picturesque skerries up to the Gulf of Bothnia. But we also remembered another, already severe time, when the British squadron, which came to the aid of General Udenik, was based in the Bjorksum Strait. From here made their ignominious raid on Kronstadt British torpedo boats. The interventionists had to leave in disgrace. Well, the time will come and will drive the fascists away from here. On the roadstead of Coivisto stood two of our gunboats, armoured boats and landing barges of the Skerries Brigade. It was quite an impressive artillery force the gunboats had 130mm guns. From the brigade commander, Captain 3rd Rank Lazo, 
we learned that the personnel of the Vyborg fortified sector of the fleet coastal defence and a special regiment of sailors, covering the withdrawal of two divisions from Vyborg, had already been taken to the island of Bjorko and a circular defence was organised there. If the Nazis appear on the shore of the bay and try to force the strait, the ships of the brigade are ready to support the defence of the island with their fire. N.G. Bogdanov contacted the commander of the artillery division Bjorko. There, too, all were in full combat readiness, but no one knew where the fascists and where our units were. From Kronstadt I received word that our patrol ships had not once detected the enemy at sea during the day and that two transports had already left the port of Leningrad. Gantsov rejoiced. So, they will come at night. We moored at the pier. The coast lay before us deserted and mysterious. We decided that the infantrymen were hiding in the forest. We sent sailors in two directions. Soon several army men appeared on the pier. They turned out to be company commanders of different regiments and different divisions. They looked gloomy, their faces haggard, their voices hoarse. Many could not hear well. I could see that my comrades had suffered a lot. I ask. Are there many wounded? A lot. Um. I told about the purpose of our arrival here and ordered to urgently search for any of the division commanders, emphasising that every minute was precious. It began to get dark, the glow of fires and shooting could be heard behind the forest. On the shore arrived the commander of one of the divisions with the remnants of the headquarters and political department. He was as tired as the others, but he kept up cheerfully. Tight, strict, he quickly got up to speed. He and I drew up a plan of action. It was necessary, first of all, to organise the cover of the withdrawal, to gather the most combat-ready companies. I have no guns or tanks, he warned. It's all right, we have 130mm guns on our ships, we'll support you. The division commander immediately gave the necessary orders. First we decided to load about 2,000 wounded on the ships. Then the divisions will be loaded with fighters. The commander said that he and his staff will be the last to leave the pier. Energetic Bogdanov organised from sailors' commandant service, which maintained strict order on the shore. In the darkness came the first transport and moored at the pier. They began to load the wounded. Bogdanov with his thunderous voice announced that after the wounded on the ships will be taken healthy fighters, but only those who kept their weapons. This warning had its basis we noticed that some of the Red Army men were walking unarmed. There were shouts. Yes, where can I get a rifle? And then a mocking answer came very conveniently. And where you left it there and take it. The commanders quickly built the companies, at a signal from the pier led them to the gangways. Loading was organised and fast. People cheered up, jokes were heard. But those who had not saved their weapons huddled aside. They looked depressed and confused. I approached them. Comrade Admiral, we didn't lose our weapons for good. It's not our fault we're from the battle. I felt sorry for the guys, and I was about to allow them to land, but suddenly I noticed that they one by one, two by two, began to run away into the woods. After a while the fighters returned from there transformed. Everyone had a machine gun in their hands, many of them also had loaded discs. A young soldier rushed to catch up with his company, shaking his automatic rifle. Brothers, I got a ticket for the steamship. The transport is already full. Where's the second one? Gantsov is nervous. There are thousands of people on the shore. And suddenly we receive a report the second transport at the entrance to the Bjerkeson Strait exploded and sank. It is not known whether he ran into a mine or did not notice the torpedo fired from a submarine, but the fact is that he died. Captain First Rank Zozulia came to the rescue. He said that he had already sent another transport to replace the lost one. Because of the mine danger, we decided not to send transports in the dark. Until dawn, we'll leave them at the roadstead in full readiness for anchoring. The commander of the division reported that the fascists have weakened the pressure and as if they were bypassing the bay. It is necessary to remove all the people from the shore overnight, I said to the commander. It was obvious that the evacuation should be finished while the enemy air reconnaissance is not flying. 
but then a new trouble our largest transport, turning around at the roadstead, ran aground. The captain demanded tugs. Ivan Nikolaevich Gantsov raged on the bridge of the ill-fated steamer, but the captain was unperturbed. Give him tugs and that's it. We had to send Bogdanov to help Gantsov. He had a short conversation. If you can't get off the shoal, the transport will have to be blown up, as in three, four hours the fascists will be here. I will now send sailors to lay explosives. The captain did not expect such a turn of events. Now he promised to do without tugs. At least let some boat to bring the anchors. The boat was found. Long before dawn, the transport was already standing at the pier and received another regiment of infantrymen. The captain himself supervised the loading, hurried the soldiers and monitored their placement. During the night, other transports arrived. Without delay took people and stood on the roadstead. In the forest increased machine gun and rifle fire. Impatiently we waited for dawn, but its first glare did not bring us anything good. Ship's anti-aircraft guns slammed a fascist scout was circling in the air, but suddenly he hurriedly flew away. Over the roadstead sounded the ringing voices of our fighters. They patrolled over the ships for a long time. It became clear to everyone that this is our planned cover of the passage. How everybody became animated at once. It is a big thing support from the air. The transports were taking off anchors and leaving for Kronstadt. I ordered gunboats to stand at the pier. They were to receive the covering groups. And here the piers were filled with peasants from nearby villages already occupied by the enemy. Our Tallinn experience told us that in the very last minutes people appeared from nowhere and they had to be picked up. The stars in the clear sky had faded, the glow of the fires, which at night had such an irritating effect on everyone. The last transport disappeared behind the cape, followed by the armoured boats of the guard, and people were still coming out of the forest men, women with children. The canal boat, crowded with passengers, also departed from the pier. The raid was deserted. Well, Admiral, as if everything was in order, cheerfully said the division commander. Leaving for insurance a few boats from the brigade of scary ships, we also gave the moorings in the evening. Just turning around, as the sailors noticed a large dog rushing with its tongue out. When he reached the head of the pier, he howled desperately. Everyone looked at him with regret. A young snub-nosed sailor signalman raised his binoculars and reported very loudly for the whole roadstead to the boat commander. Comrade Senior Lieutenant, there's a dog on the breakwater asking to be taken aboard. It was said with a tremor in his voice, as if the signalman himself heard the request of his four-legged friend. Voices were heard on deck. We must take it, it's our dog from the canal boat. And we approached the pier again. From a distance of several metres the dog jumped on the boat's tank. He squealed with joy, caressed each of us. He must have gone all quipped one of the Red Army soldiers. We are going by the strait, the sea is quiet. Unnoticeably approached the lighthouse stir sudden, raised our call signs, carried them for five minutes, but no one responds. Zernov is worried. Are they asleep, slackers? It can't be. An experienced senior enlisted man is there. We come closer. And instead of answering to our signal far away from the boat, there is a splash from a small calibre shell, either a field gun or a tank. At the same time, a machine gun crackles. It's clear. Communication post and lighthouse in the hands of the fascists. The boat rushed to the side, and we rushed to Kronstadt. There was a cheerful command dinner for the crew. The XO invited us to the wardroom, a small cosy cabin at the stern. The guests were let forward. They hardly mastered the narrow vertical gangway. Comrade Admiral, exclaimed the division commander, Yes, you have here as in peacetime. We don't remember when we had a normal lunch, and in general we haven't seen hot food for a long time. And the table was set as usual in the ship's wardroom white tablecloth, cutlery, shot glasses, and a decanter filled with rationed vodka. Sailors have always been characterised by hospitality. The sailor's messenger treated the greying commander and his companions with special, I would say, filial affection. 
As they say, the dinner was held in a friendly and relaxed atmosphere, and I note with repeated addition of the first and the second. We overtook the transports, on the decks of which there was no place for an apple to fall. The soldiers gradually came away from everything they had experienced. The sounds of the harmonium were blowing over the sea. Here it is, unbending, unflappable, our Soviet soldier. Kronstadt from the sea seemed to be a giant ship coming at us. We could see bright flashes. The heavy guns of the northern forts were firing in the area of Zelenogorsk, Sestroetsk, and the battleship and cruiser were firing in the area south of Iranianbaum. On our right, the 12-inch guns of Krasnia Gorka were pounding heavily. On both banks, the fires were blazing. Black smoke was rising upwards in a wall. There was an unimaginable rumble in the air. The fleet was crushing the fascists, helping their army. My commander and I stood silently at the stern of the boat. Greatly fires Kronstadt, he said with admiration. At such moments especially strengthened the belief that all our failures are temporary. The hour would come and the enemy would be defeated. Once again, from under the very nose of the fascists, the fleet transferred more than 12,000 soldiers to Leningrad. A lot of help to the front. And together with the wounded and civilian population, we evacuated about 14,000 people. All were taken off the shore and delivered to Kronstadt. The last boats left there, in the bay, returned without passengers. Before the eyes of our sailors, the fascists occupied the empty Koivisto. Hearts blazing with anger. The day after our return from Koivisto, Captain Guntsov and I were sent to Smolny for a meeting on the evacuation of the population from Leningrad. It was our duty to report how many wagons were needed for the families of the fleet servicemen. Admittedly, there was no such information neither in the headquarters nor in the political department of the fleet. This circumstance embarrassed me. But it was necessary to go, because in addition to everything else I had to establish personal contact with the headquarters of the Len Front to clarify a number of organisational issues. According to a long-established habit, we first got by boat to Iranianbaum and then went to Leningrad by car. The headquarters garage was located on the outskirts of Iranianbaum. I had not been on the southern shore of the Gulf of Finland for only two and a half months, but how many changes there are here. Oranienbaum, Peterhof, Martishkino and other Dutch suburbs of Leningrad have acquired a pronounced front appearance. Camouflaged cars with soldiers and military cargoes, sanitary vans with big red crosses are rushing along the streets. The highway is already badly battered, must have passed tanks and artillery tractors. Broken and overturned cars and trailers are lying on the sides of the road. There are no people to be seen in the roadside houses. Windows are either broken or boarded up. Apparently this is characteristic of a warrior all life. The beating of its pulse is centred on the roads. There is not only the incessant rumble of cars, but also the hum of young and ringing or hoarse, torn voices. We drive slowly. Our shiny Zeese is a white crow in the endless stream of dusty front-line cars. Someone pushed someone. Someone is prevented to pass. All this can't do without strong words so there is a ringing of voices over the road. What are you doing? Slow down a bit. Hurry up, you'll sleep later. But on the truck you can hear a harmonica and a catchy Russian song. And all against the background of the continuous cannonade of the fleet's heavy guns. If we could record all this music of the road on a record, Ivan Nikolaevich joked. We are moving forward, as if we were floating down the river on a raft neither to stop nor to turn back. Petty Officer First Article Karnok, the best driver of our garage, is nervous. On the shiny body of the car has never had a spot, and here we have already been scratched thoroughly, and not once. Here comes Leningrad, my hometown. I look at it, at the streets and houses familiar from my childhood. I want to ask, well, old boy, how are you feeling but what to ask? If everything is clear, the city has closed its eyes and frowned sternly. Houses at street intersections turned into artillery and machine gun points. Steel muzzles are visible in the embrasures of pillboxes. Streets and avenues are blocked by anti-tank piles. Narrow passages are left for passage. Mirrored store windows are boarded up and covered with sandbags. The huge windows of the famous Elisievsky store do not shine with lights. Elisievsky store. There are no horses on a Nikov bridge. 
Instead of the bronze horsemen, there is a mountain of boards and sandbags. There are fewer people on the streets. Everyone is in a fussy, anxious hurry. We are approaching Smolny. It is perfectly camouflaged, camouflaged by a grandiose camouflage net. Even at a close distance, it is difficult to distinguish the contours of the building, drowning in the autumn faded greenery. We climb up the historic steps. There are a lot of military men, but everywhere the usual cleanliness. In the corridor is muted silence, only rarely squeak boots. Voices and the clatter of typewriters are barely audible behind the doors of the offices. I met my childhood friend, Captain First Rank V. I. Rotkovsky, in the Naval Department of the Lenflot Headquarters. Vladimir Ivanovich is an excellent officer operator. Educated with a great experience of work in the general staff, he was also very cheerful, full of humour and optimism. These qualities helped him in the most difficult days in Leningrad, and then in the Crimea, where he was sent to perform important tasks. Naturally, to understand the situation, we first of all came to V. I. Rutkovsky. I shared with him my concerns about the inaccuracy of my information about the number of families to be evacuated. Vladimir Ivanovich hastened to reassure me. Yuri Alexandrovich, don't be discouraged. Nobody knows anything. With this case, obviously someone messed up. Come by after the meeting, we'll talk. In the large office of the commander of the Leningrad Front, near the wall, stood a long table covered with dark cloth. At the table sat Key Voroshilov. He looked tired. It seemed to me that he felt ill, had a cold and spoke in a voice not peculiar to him, quiet and sluggish. Many military and civilian people had gathered in the office, among them several women. All those summoned were seated around the table. The windows of the office were curtained with black material, so the room was stuffy and gloomy. Except for the marshal, we did not know anyone by sight. Here were gathered unit commanders, heads of military institutions and enterprises, representatives of Soviet and party organisations. From the speeches, we realised that the plan of evacuation of the population was not fulfilled. There was a lot of unfortunate confusion and just plain negligence. Many Leningrad residents with their families refused to leave their homes and did not dare to let their children go alone. Many were frightened by the distant trip to unfamiliar lands. After all, all the property accumulated over the years had to be abandoned to fate. In addition, people remembered the mistakes made in the first weeks of the war. At the end of July, 10th echelons with more than 15,000 children were sent from Leningrad. For some reason, the trains were sent to the west of the Leningrad region. And there the enemy was already approaching. Almost at gunpoint, the echelons managed to turn back to Leningrad. But when they arrived in the city, most of the children's parents left for evacuation. The children were sent to the east, but for a long time the parents did not even know their addresses. Speakers at the meeting said that echelons with evacuees were idle for many days on the spare tracks. Their direction was endlessly changed. In general, there was a lot of confusion. This is because at that time they did not think much about the war. At the meeting someone said in his defence, pardon me, who could suppose that the enemy would be near Leningrad. Yes, it was hard to think about it. But the fact that Finnish airfields are located ten minutes from Leningrad was known for a long time. It obliged us to a lot. On August 29th, the last trains left Leningrad. Soon after that, the stations of Mgu and Chudovo were captured by fascists. The connection of the city with the country by railroad was interrupted. Marshal Voroshilov sternly demanded an answer why the government's decision on evacuation was not fulfilled. And we, Navy men, got it for the fact that many families of servicemen were stuck in Leningrad. As a result of all the measures taken by the authorities, it was possible to evacuate only about 500,000 Leningraders, while it was necessary to evacuate three times more. Thus, almost two and a half million inhabitants remained in the blockaded city, and in the suburbs, 343,000. But the worst of all, among the remaining population were 400,000 children. The meeting ended rather quickly and left us with a vague and heavy impression. The next day the military council of the Lenfront made a decision to continue evacuation on a compulsory basis and in the nearest future to take out at least one million inhabitants through Schlisselburg. 
But this decision could not be realized four days later Schlisselberg was occupied by the enemy. Superfluous people in the city, superfluous victims. Very soon it became obvious to everyone. After the meeting we returned to V. I, Rutkowski. He greeted us in a friendly manner. What are you upset about, Admiral? I shared my impressions of the meeting. Vladimir Ivanovich interrupted me. It's still nothing, we'll take people out through Ladoga, but I'll tell you something else. We sat down at the table, digging through the papers V.I. Rutkowski handed me a few sheets. Ours captured curious documents. Hitler ordered to take Leningrad by all means before the onset of frost. Only after that he intends to attack Moscow. As you see, here we will defend Moscow. Is that clear? Rutkowski showed us fascist leaflets which said we will raise Leningrad to the ground and Kronstadt to the water. The gentleman wanted a lot. The insolence and primitiveness of fascist propaganda was astonishing. They count on fools, not otherwise. We were interested in everything related to the defense of Leningrad. V.I. Rutkowski introduced me to his comrades' employees of the Front Operational Department. They told me how the city was preparing for defence. One could only marvel at how much Leningraders had time to do. At the call of party and Soviet organisations, more than 80,000 people worked on the construction of defensive structures. In a short period of time, about 400 armoured points for guns and about 700 machine gun nests were erected. Several thousand bomb shelters, pillboxes and bunkers were created. On the outskirts grew barricades the city was preparing for street battles. We hope that the Navy will support us with artillery, said the Colonel from the Operational Department. Do you have a lot of it? At the disposal of the fleet was 338 guns of ships, forts and railroad batteries of calibre from 100mm and above, including 78 guns of calibre from 180 to 406mm. The numbers are solid. The panes in the windows rang with the rumble of heavy guns fired at Rezevka from the naval proving ground. Mighty music. On September 4th, just before daylight, Rear Admiral I, I. Gren, the Chief of Artillery of the Naval Defence of Leningrad, arrived at the fleet headquarters. Like many old artillerymen, Ivan Ivanovich was slightly deaf, but his friends laughed, assuring that things pleasant to him he hears better, and all the unpleasant reaches his hearing with great difficulty. Recalled the incident in the Kremlin at the reception of military sailors, Stalin criticised the choice of calibre of guns for new ships. Ivan Ivanovich sat blankly, apparently heard nothing. He was then in the rank of Captain First Rank. Noticing the silent commander, Stalin warily asked who it is. People's Commissar of the Navy explained that this is a very knowledgeable artilleryman, self-consciously in love with his profession and made a great contribution to the development of naval artillery. On this Stalin softly said, addressing the Narcom in that case, he should be given a higher rank. Ivan Ivanovich at these words jumped up and loudly retorted, I serve the Soviet Union. Rarely polite and alert. I. I. Gren was small in stature, thin, almost always with a pleasant, inviting smile, did not like verbosity, spoke quietly, muffled, sometimes stopping the interlocutor, please, please speak more quietly. I can hear you well. This time Rear Admiral Gren arrived in Kronstadt on a very important matter. It was necessary to organise the fire control of several hundred guns of the fleet, which means to ensure reliable communication, quickly assign targets, select the calibre for their defeat, regulate the consumption of ammunition. Back in August in Leningrad was created management of artillery sea defence of Leningrad. Now, given that the entire fleet was based on Leningrad and Kronstadt, this directorate was enlarged to the fleet scale. Rear Admiral Gren was appointed Chief of Fleet Artillery, and was operationally subordinate to the Front Artillery Commander. All requests from the Front and Army Headquarters for artillery support were concentrated in this new directorate. I. I. Gren's command post was located in the basement of the Naval Academy on Vasilyevsky Island. Now we had to outline artillery positions for ships and railroad batteries, as well as to determine the areas to be fired by coastal batteries. 
It was necessary to establish clear and reliable communication between land units and headquarters of ship formations and forts to agree on common signals. The experience gained during the defense of Tallinn helped us a lot, and soon all the issues were resolved. In this work, in addition to artillerymen, participated a large team of officers, staff operators, fleet communicators, specialists of the ciphering and staff service of Officer Kashin, to improve the interaction of our artillery with land units in the headquarters of each of the coastal armies, was appointed as a communications officer marine artilleryman. I. I. Gren attached special importance to the organization of fire correction, which again required experienced artillerymen and liaison officers. And there were not enough people. A lot of sailors were lost in Tallinn, even more were given to marine brigades. We had to reduce Ivan Ivanovich's appetite to the utmost, he was angry and exhorted. Understand I want to shoot at fascists, not at squares. Give me men for observation posts. We sighed, again calculated our capabilities and, alas, had to upset I. I, Gren. Still, almost all the ships and batteries created two NP as one, the main at the front edge of the defence and the second, the reserve in its depth. We divided the ships into three groups. The first group, the Neva River Ships Detachment, consisted of new destroyers, gunboats, patrol ships, minesweepers and boats, occupying positions between Smolny and Yustijora. The detachment was commanded for some time by Captain First Rank Cherokov, and then all fall and winter by Captain First Rank Solukin. The second, Leningrad group of ships included the cruiser Petropavlovsk, which stood in the area of the coal harbour of the trade port, the cruiser Maxim Gorky, and several destroyers, which took up positions in the area of the trade port. The third group was formed by ships of the Kronstadt Oranienbaum area battleship October Revolution, cruiser Kirov. In Kronstadt, several destroyers and submarines in Oranienbaum and on Kronstadt raids, battleship Marat in the bucket of the Sea Canal. The northern forts of Kronstadt represented a separate powerful artillery group with guns up to and including 10-inch calibre. And finally, a very special group was the railroad artillery and artillery of the Naval Scientific Test Site. These were dozens of batteries with guns of calibre from 100 to 406 millimetres. This was the scheme of organisation of the fleet artillery, which was under the operational subordination of Rear Admiral I. I. Gren. Together it was a major force, a significant support for the land front near Leningrad. All day in the headquarters, boiled work on the compilation and harmonisation of documents necessary for reliable management of a large mass of naval fire. Ivan Ivanovich, it turns out that now you have more fire than we had in Tallinn. I jokingly remarked. It could have been even more, replied the insatiable grin. We gave all our reserve in the warehouses and the guns from the Aurora to the front. About 20 guns in Polkovo, Dudagov and the same number sent with a detachment of sailors near Moscow. The fleet helped the army, Leningrad and Moscow in any way it could. During the day our work was twice interrupted by urgent reports. At 12 o'clock from the headquarters of the sea defence of Leningrad reported that heavy enemy artillery shelled the station Vitebskaya sorting, plants Salalin and Red Oilman. Then came the report of shelling of the plant Bolshevik and the 5th hydroelectric power station. These were the first shells to fall in Leningrad. The unexpected barbaric artillery raid brought great sacrifices. The fire was conducted by 240 mm guns from the Tosno area. I called my relatives on the phone. From the conversation with them, I realized that the first shelling made a depressing impression on Leningraders. My elderly father, hero of labor, a hereditary Leningrad resident, said to me reproachfully, well, son, now then, can't you go out on the street? Can't you curb them, the damned? We should have evacuated in time. The old man interrupted. I've already told you Leningrad is my homeland. I'm not going anywhere from here. And angrily hung up the phone. That was not the first conversation we had had with my father about evacuation. And many thousands of Leningraders answered the authorities in exactly the same way. Simultaneously with the centralization of fire control of the artillery of the army and fleet, 
There was also centralization of control of all forces and means of air defense. Fleet fighter aviation, ship and coastal anti-aircraft artillery were included in a unified system of air defense of Leningrad. Frankly speaking, such an organization did not suit us at that time. About what Komflot repeatedly reported to the front commander. The point is that if the ships standing within the boundaries of Leningrad on the Neva River were entirely included in the air defense zone of the city and simultaneously covered by it, then the line ships in the Neva Bay and the Kronstadt fortress with its ships did not have sufficient protection from airstrikes. Life demanded the creation here of an independent air defense system for the fleet and the fortress. In those hot days our claims were not taken seriously. They even tried to accuse us that we, sailors, always find specific features of the fleet and therefore are prone to a kind of separatism. What happened? The air defence system of the city worked reliably and the ships in Kronstadt remained almost defenceless. Looking ahead, I will say that as long as the enemy did not target the fleet, everything was fine. But as soon as the air raids on Kronstadt began, we began to suffer very tangible losses. But about it further. Fleet aviation in operational terms was subordinate to the commander of the Air Force Front, Major General AAA Novikov. Stavka considered it necessary to concentrate all air forces of the fleet and the front in the same hands for the most effective defence of Leningrad. And it was difficult to object to this. And in general, in those days there was no time to argue. In Kronstadt the thunder of the 12-inch guns of the battleship Marat did not subside. It was echoed by the guns of the battleship October Revolution. Ships of the Neva River Detachment were firing from the U.S. Izora area. They were firing at the fascist troops who had already approached the Ivanovsky Rapids. Two cannon boats continuously supported the troops of the 23rd Army in the area of Sestroretsk. Hitlerites went on a terrible meanness. They rained hundreds of shells on the city in the morning when workers went to work and in the evening when people returned from the factories. This was the case on September 5th. Hundreds of civilians were killed and wounded. Many houses on Romenskia and Glazovaya streets were turned into ruins. It was savage barbarism. Only the rabid enemies of humanity could dare to do such a thing. Hatred and thirst for revenge for innocent victims burned the hearts of Soviet soldiers and sailors. Naval reconnaissance established that fascist artillerymen fired on the city at first from the area of Tosno, but fearing our retaliation, quickly moved to the areas of Strilna, Yuritsk, Volodarsky and Pushkin. I call I. I. Gren. How long will the Hitlerites shell the city with impunity? Do not worry. We have developed reliable methods of counter-battery fight. Soon the fascists will squeal. You can be sure of it. Gren didn't throw words in the wind. After talking to him, I felt a little better. Near Leningrad played out major events. The situation was constantly changing, and the fleet commander had to spend almost all the time at the front headquarters. In addition, a good half of our ships stood on the Neva. Only late in the evening VF tributes returned by boat to Kronstadt, listened to reports, gave instructions for the next day, and in the morning again went to Leningrad. Komflot, using the large headquarters of the naval defence of Leningrad, based in the city, often had to give orders directly to the ships in the Neva and Ladoga military flotilla. It was clearly felt that the presence of two headquarters, the naval defence of Leningrad and the fleet headquarters in Kronstadt, in the current situation was unnecessary. But the tense situation did not allow us to solve any organisational problems at that time, because all forces were concentrated on stopping the enemy and saving Leningrad. One late evening returning from Leningrad, Vice Admiral Tributes came to the land map. Yes, it's like this, he said slowly. I realised that he was recalling the map of the situation which he had seen at the front headquarters and was comparing it with ours. How are things at the front? I asked. It's going, devil. He's pulling up new forces, though we are hammering him, but he is still climbing. I realised that it was possible not to ask such a question, it was difficult to answer it. Besides, all frontal affairs were clearly reflected on our map. Early in the morning Komflot was leaving for Leningrad again by boat. 
I saw him off at the wharf and warned him that yesterday a mine had been discovered on the Petrovsky fairway. It had not been detonated yet. In addition, in Leningrad again, shelling. In response to my warnings, he only smiled and waved his hand. The speedboat sped off and soon disappeared behind the breakwater. The only thing visible was a low mast moving over the stone wall, and on it a bright red flag with three white stars. We received a report from General Elisiv with an alarming message the enemy began an attack on the Moonsund archipelago. It was to be expected that the enemy would concentrate significant forces and create superiority not only on the ground, but also in the air. Our garrison on the islands barely exceeded 23,000 soldiers. That's less than two divisions, with a completely weak air defence of 25 to 30 anti-aircraft guns, and we could not help the garrisons of the islands. All fleet aviation was used by the front to repel the enemy advancing on Leningrad. We had no available troops. One hope on the heroism of our soldiers and sailors. We learned that the garrison of the small island of Osmosar, where there was only one battery, repulsed the enemy landing, approached by 20 boats and motorboats. Batteries on the islands of the Moons of the Moons and Archipelago and on the Hanko Peninsula together with mine barriers closed the enemy's way to the Gulf of Finland and thus covered Leningrad on the distant sea approaches. We realised that the garrisons of the Moonsund Islands and Hanko were drawing away large enemy forces that could be thrown at Leningrad. Our ships disrupted the enemy's communications in the Gulf of Finland and the Gulf of Riga, disrupted the Nazi army's food supply. Bombardments of Berlin, conducted from the airfields of Esel, caused panic in Germany. This was the meaning of the defence of Moonsund and Hanko, although they were deep behind enemy lines. The Nazi command was in a frenzy. It was in a hurry to seize the islands. 50,000 soldiers numbered the group involved in this operation. It was supported by 60 aircraft, light fleet forces and airborne units. The Nazis began the offensive from the east, from that side, where the weakest was our anti-landing defence. Reports from Moonsunder were immediately reported to the Komflot in Leningrad. On September 7th, the city was subjected to the first aerial bombardment. Fascist planes had tried to break through to Leningrad many times before, but they were met and dispersed by our fighters. But today they failed to do so. Junkers were over the city. The bombs exploded on the territory of the factory Pyatiletka, on Ligovskaya Street, destroyed a large house on Nevsky. Leningrad suffered the first victims of aerial bombardment. The enemy expected that he would break the will of the Soviet people with this. But he miscalculated. Barbarian raids on the city caused not confusion, but only even greater hatred of the enemy and the desire to fight to the end, to victory. People were even more united into a single monolithic force, whose name became synonymous with valour and glory Lenin raiders. But not only sorrows fell on our shoulders. At night we received encouraging information from the front headquarters the troops of the 8th Army in the area of Peterhof stopped the fascists. Together with the army men, the marine infantry units fought heroically here, especially selflessly, and steadfastly fought cadets of the Higher Naval Engineering School named after F. E. Dzerzhinsky. The Nazi attempt to break through the shortest way to Leningrad was repulsed with heavy losses for them. The southern group of the enemy, although came to the Neva River near Schlisselburg, but also did not break through to Leningrad. In both directions, our land forces were greatly assisted by the artillery of the fleet. Barbaric shelling and bombing of the city, although late, moved the problem of evacuation. The next day we were sending many families of sailors to the rear. Their way became difficult and long. All railroad tracks were cut off, so the evacuees were sent to the Osinovitz lighthouse on Ladoga, and from there they were taken by barges, tugboats and ships of the Ladoga flotilla to the southeastern shore of the lake. Then they were taken by trucks to the Volkovstroy railroad station. If we add to this that the enemy was desperately bombing our ships on Ladoga, the complexity of such a journey becomes obvious. I was instructed to check the organisation of evacuation of the last echelon and conduct it outside the city on the Vyborg side. My family was also leaving in this echelon. Except for my father. The old man categorically refused to leave Leningrad. During the week that I was not in the city, it became even more severe. Barricades, concrete hollows and wire fences appeared in the streets. 
There were anti-aircraft batteries in the squares and gardens. There were fewer cars, although the streets were still crowded. After seeing off a convoy of buses and trucks with women, children and old people, I looked into the front headquarters. We were worried about the anti-aircraft cover of the ships standing in the Neva outside the city. They fired all day long, supporting our land units, but they themselves remained poorly protected from the air, as all air defence forces were turned primarily to the defence of the city. This is what I wanted to talk about in the Maritime Department and in the Operational Department of the Front Headquarters. My arrival at Smolny was this time unsuccessful. In the corridor I met Alexei Alexandrovich Kuznetsov, a member of the Military Council of the Front, Secretary of the City Party Committee, who had noticeably lost weight during that time, but was still pleasant, soft and attentive. I reported why I had come and what I was doing in the city. Alexei Alexandrovich, as a party leader, always helped the fleet and was respected among the sailors. He met me with a kind, charming smile, shook my hand on the way and said, apologising. It's a pity we don't have time to talk. The situation is heating up. I recommend you hurry to Kronstadt. Greetings to the Komflot and all comrades. And everyone I met in the wide corridor was preoccupied, hurrying somewhere. In the naval department almost all the officers were in a rush. What happened? Vladimir Ivanovich. I asked Rutkovsky. In response I heard the same thing that Kuznetsov had said. Yuri Alexandrovich. Let's go to Kronstadt as soon as possible. There's nothing for you to do here. What's the matter? The fascists have started an offensive in the Red Guard direction. Apparently they'll again attack Krasnoy Selo and through Yuritsky, Leningrad. Today the enemy entered the zone of fire of the ships of the Leningrad group. The cruisers Gorky and Petropavlovsk have just opened fire. Apparently will shoot Murat. Ladoga flotilla moved from Schlisselberg to Novaya Ladoga. All the chiefs have left for their units. The situation is extremely tense. Is that clear? With a heavy fee feeling I left the office and hurried to Kronstadt. Passing Avtovo, I could well distinguish the rumble of 180mm guns of the cruiser Maxim Gorky, standing in the area of the bread mole of the trade port. The line ship Marat, which was at the head of the sea canal, silenced the cruiser with the base of its 12-inch guns, and the nearer to Oranian balm, the more formidable the cannonade became. And here are the flashes in Kronstadt of ships firing on the raids, beating and northern forts. And no matter how exciting this picture for the military heart, still pressed anxiety for the city, for our Leningrad. An avalanche of steel from hundreds of guns must stop the enemy. But what if it doesn't? I chase such thoughts away. It can't be. I try to listen to the rumble of the cannonade, the evidence of our strength. And here we are in Kronstadt. The city lives and works hard. Daily fire we conduct and day and night from ships and northern forts, supporting the flanks of our armies. On the north shore alone the fleet fired 2,100 heavy shells during the week. The army men thank us and assure us that the Finns are entrenching themselves and moving to defence on the line of the old state border. These reports cheer and encourage us. Things are worse in Moonsund. The new report of General Elisiv, although it is in optimistic tones, but in essence the situation there is tragic. The fascists landed on the island of Worms, began shelling the island of Muhu and the Kuivast area. It is obvious that this is a preparation for landing on Easel. Our artillery is responding, the garrison has prepared for hard fighting, but it is so small in comparison with the enemy army. Again and again we discussed in the headquarters what and how to help the islands, but unfortunately there was neither strength nor opportunities. And the weather was not corresponding to our thoughts and moods dry and clear. Golden autumn, or Indian summer, as it is commonly called. Gardens and parks in Kronstadt, dressed up in a fabulous outfit. The headquarters garden also blossomed with autumn colours. It was so warm that during the day we even opened the windows. All commanders lived in the headquarters, in their offices. The work went on uninterruptedly, the boundaries between day and night were erased, only light and darkness alternated. We rested only for short periods of time. 
and we naively thought ourselves safe, although the huge white building of the headquarters and political department of the fleet with its ancient turret towered above the surrounding houses and flooded with sunshine, probably was perfectly visible to the enemy from the southern shore of the bay. On September 8th in the morning Comflot was reported the plan of transition of submarine P-1 to Hanko. It should deliver to the naval base medical supplies and ammunition for field guns. The plan was approved, and the commander of the submarine began to prepare the trip. The boat was to go to the island of Gobland with a guard, and then independently. To support the 8th Army units in the area of Shapelevsky Lighthouse, the submarine Krasnoye Znamia again went to the area of Shapelevsky Lighthouse, guarded by minesweepers and patrol boats. The crew of this ship had accumulated great experience in firing on the shore in support of our infantry. The Army Command often informed us send the Kanodka Red Banner. It shoots very well. From a telephone conversation with the Fleet Air Force Commander, Major General M.I. Samokin, I realised that these days we should not count on particularly intensive reconnaissance of the maritime sector. Mikhail Ivanovich, usually good-natured, has always been somewhat stubborn I was used to it. But today his good-naturedness was disturbed by something, and I could sense irritation in his voice. Yuri Alexandrovich, he said, nervously I understand that you are responsible for the exploration of the sea, but understand my position. Tonight we bombed a cluster of German troops in the village of Sisto Polkino. Do you know who we sent on the bombing raid? Seaplanes. You see, it's come to this we're using seaplanes for this. Do you understand? Yes, I understood if the slow-moving sea reconnaissance MBR2s turned into bombers, it means that things are tough there, at the front. Usually the barometer of the state of affairs near Leningrad were our requests for artillery fire from the ground forces. Therefore, even before receiving official reports, we in the headquarters knew where the Nazis press, trying to break through our front, and where the situation was particularly difficult. Thus, on September 8th in the morning all ships, including the battleship October Revolution, and the cruiser Kirov were firing intensively on the area of Krasnoye Selo and south of Peterhof. The Leningrad group of ships and the Neva River ship detachment were also firing. The cannonade was incredible, one could feel the build-up of great events they were approaching. Kronstadt with its guns and ships was ready at the first call to rush to the aid of Leningrad, with all its power of hundreds of guns and thousands of pure and loyal sailors' hearts. We were informed that during the day several air alarms were announced in Leningrad, but they were in vain enemy planes did not appear. There were still streetcars running in the city and some store windows were lit up at dusk, but the war was inexorably approaching, and the peaceful colours of life in the big city in the evening of that day immediately faded. First we received word of heavy artillery shelling of the streets, and then of a large air raid. At that time I was considering the plan of the next mine laying on the outskirts of Kronstadt. It was already completely dark, the blackout curtains were gloomily blackened on the windows. Rear Admiral Valentin Petrovich Drozd, commander of the squadron, tall, thin, with a shifty face and sharp movements, entered the office noisily, gustily. Chief of Staff, drop your business. Quickly let's go to the tower, and grabbed me by the sleeve and dragged me behind him. What's wrong? I asked him on the way, but Drozd kept saying the same thing. Faster, faster. In a few minutes we found ourselves on the open bridge of the signal tower, which architecturally completed the ensemble of the fleet headquarters building. Signalmen, pointing binoculars at Leningrad, were silent. Looking to the east, I froze on the distant horizon, where familiar outlines of the city usually loomed, now a sea of fire was raging. There was no smoke in the darkness, but the bloody streak of flame flared up, becoming brighter and higher, and slightly faded and appeared in another place. Explosions were clearly heard, merging into a continuous rumble. Dazed we watched this picture, everyone's heart clenched painfully. Our native city was burning. In the fortress, and on the ships an air alert was declared, because at any moment airplanes could appear over Kronstadt. From the bridges of large ships, from all observation posts people looked at Leningrad, engulfed in fire. Everyone had the impression that the whole city was burning. Admiral Drozd soon left for the cruiser Kirov, 
where he kept his flag I went to the command post of the Kronstadt Fortress Air Defence. It was quiet underground, no shooting was heard here. There were only muffled ringing of telephones, clicking of devices and reports of sailors Planchetistov, who put the situation on large lighted screens. The whole night passed in suspense. From the reports we learned that the enemy raid began at about 19.00. The bombs fell immediately after the air alarm signal. The enemy tried not only to destroy the city, but also to burn it to the ground. Planes dropped a huge number of incendiary bombs. At 22.30, a new raid. 12,000 incendiaries and about 50 bombs of large calibre, from 250 to 500 kilograms, were dropped. About 200 fires broke out in the city. Moskovsky and Smolinsky districts suffered most of all from incendiary bombs. Many bombs fell in the area of the Finland railway station. From 12 residential houses remained only ruins. The city water supply system was destroyed. For more than five hours were burning food warehouses named after Badaev. These warehouses, wooden construction, stood since 1914. There were no fire breaks between them, so the fire quickly spread from one building to another. 3,000 tons of flour and about 2,500 tons of sugar perished. True, some of the burnt sugar was later used. Unfortunately, there were some enemy and just malicious talkers in the city, who always know. All the news they started a rumour that because of unreasonable storage of food in one place, the whole population was deprived of two-year and even three-year reserves at once, and that's why the famine came so quickly. This was criminal chatter, calculated to undermine the spirit of the already anxious people. Of course, it was unfortunate that flour and sugar were not dispersed in advance to various bases, but we knew well that the main city, fleet and army food supplies were stored in other places, including the Kronstadt Fortress, so the famine came later, regardless of the fires of September 8th. We find a true description of that tragic night in the book of the Commissioner of the State Defence Committee for food supply of the city and the front D. V. Pavlov houses, streets, bridges, people, hidden in the darkness, lit up with ominous flames of fires. Thick black clouds of smoke slowly stretched to the sky, poisoning the air with cinders. Night was approaching, and there seemed to be no force that could stop the advancing sea of fire. Fire departments, self-defence groups, thousands of workers, despite the fatigue after a day's work, rushed into battle with the fire element, and from their furious pressure the flames weakened and soon died out. Except for the fire in the warehouses named after Badiev, where the fire raged for more than five hours. Quite late, when the purple glow faded over Leningrad and was received the signal to cancel the air alert, I returned to the fleet headquarters and got acquainted with important reports. It was reported that the enemy is conducting intensified aerial reconnaissance in the area of Peterhof, which means that the clouds are gathering here. We can expect a new offensive. We reported this to Rear Admiral Drozd on the cruiser Kirov and the commanders of battleships, because at any moment we could urgently require fire support of troops. In the reports it was reported that significant enemy forces, having captured the MGA station, broke through to Schlisselburg and finally captured the city. Our troops partly crossed to the northern bank of the Neva, thereby strengthening the Nevsky task force partly withdrew to the east. Thus the fascists managed to close the ring of blockade around the city. From now on the communication of Leningrad with the country could be maintained only by air or by water through Lake Ladoga. The Red Banner Baltic Fleet 8th, 42nd, 55th and 23rd armies were in the blockade ring together with the population of the city. We understood that now we needed even greater centralisation of distribution of all material and technical resources and, first of all, ammunition. The very next day we passed to all commanders of compounds the order to spend ammunition strictly according to the norms. Now the ships were told exactly how much shells could be spent when setting firing tasks. Rear Admiral Gren more than once called the fleet headquarters and asked to check how many shells fired by such and such a ship. They shot perfectly, Ivan Ivanovich told me on the phone. But I know very well there are hotheads there. Please check, Yuri Alexandrovich, how many shells they fired. This is a serious matter, he asked delicately but insistently. And I had to check. Almost every day officers from the headquarters or rear were sent to the ships. 
The ships fired really well, it's true. We often received thanks from the headquarters of the units, but Rear Admiral Gren was often right he knew his wards well. Every now and then they would fire two, four or even ten shells over the norm. We had to firmly reprimand the hotheads. That night nobody rested. As soon as I lay down on the sofa, Captain First Rank Pilipovsky ran into the office. From the headquarters of the Naval Defence of Leningrad reported that, on the night of September 9th, the Nazis tried to follow our units to cross the Neva on rafts on the section Poroji Shamatevka, with the expectation to move along the northern bank of the Neva to the city. Apparently they realised that our northern bank of the Neva is still weakly fortified, but they were behind the times. Weakness was only at the very beginning of the battle for Leningrad. Five days ago, at the station Manushkino landed 115th Infantry Division, brought by us to Leningrad from the encirclement in the area of Kuivisto. Finally, the 4th Marine Brigade, which arrived from the northern islands of Lake Ladoga, has already deployed on the northern shore. Detachments formed from volunteer workers also arrived here. The fascists were defeated to the ground. Hundreds of their corpses floated down the Neva River, only they managed to see our glorious city. Not a single fascist boot never set foot on the northern bank of the Neva. Meanwhile, the enemy went on a decisive offensive along the entire Leningrad front. There was movement of troops and tanks in the area of Sestoretsk Belustrov. This area, as artillerymen at the forts joked, was their sponsored area they provided here the flank of the 23rd Army. The fleet tried its best. At dawn, the cruiser Kirov and the northern forts of the Kronstadt fortress put intense fire on the Finnish troops. Their offensive on Leningrad was quickly smothered. The main blow of the fascists struck through the Gachina fortified area to Krasnoy Selo Ligovo. They were no less zealous in their attack on the Iranian bomb patch on the southern shore of the Gulf of Finland in order to capture our strongest forts Krasnaya Gorka and Grey Horse. These forts repeatedly repulsed the attacks of the White Guards and interventionists during the Civil War, and in our days the powerful batteries of Krasnaya Gorka remained a threat to the enemy at different times of the day they opened a murderous fire from their 12-inch guns. The approaches to the forts from the land front were covered by battalions of the 2nd and 5th Marine Brigades. The 5th Brigade was formed only two weeks ago, but its men fought bravely and steadfastly, just like the men of the 2nd Brigade, created at the very beginning of the war. The situation on the Pytachok worried us very much. Here was the Iranian bomb military port, the storage of a large amount of naval property and the base of light forces of the fleet. The fascists' capture of Krasnia Gorka would be a fatal blow for us, because then Kronstadt and the whole fleet would be under direct enemy fire. We immediately informed about the situation all commanders of formations and units, so that the events unfolding on the southern shore of the bay would not be unexpected for them. To take the necessary measures on the spot in Iranian Balm came on a boat, the head of the rear of the fleet, Major General Moskalenko. Iranian Balm district was defended by units of the 8th Army, surrounded from the land half-circle of fascist troops. Together with brigades of marines and battalions of cadets of higher naval schools they held the patch, and thus Iranian Balm port and all naval batteries of the southern coast. Having established communication with the headquarters of the Iranian Balm group of troops, we during the day repeatedly inquired about the situation, ready to open on the enemy powerful artillery fire of the fleet. On our land flanks things were not so bad. Much worse was on the main direction of the Nazi attack on Leningrad at Krasnoy Selo and Ligov. Only in this direction the fleet was firing intensively from 193 guns of calibre, up to 406 millimetres it was, of course, the strongest help to the front. The rumble of artillery cannonade did not stop for an hour, and sometimes merged with the bursts of large shells, which the enemy daily shelled the city. Radio technical reconnaissance and our patrols of enemy ships in the eastern part of the Gulf of Finland did not detect. The fascist fleet made no attempt to assist its army and in this respect was far behind the tactical views that existed then in the West. In the afternoon, over Kronstadt, an Iranian bomb appeared enemy aerial reconnaissance. From the headquarters garden we watched with the naked eye the flight of the fascist, our indiscriminate anti-aircraft fire, after him and unsuccessful actions of the fighter aviation link. The German airplane was circling over Kronstadt. Our fighters were following it in a circle. 
and somewhere in the distance white clouds of anti-aircraft gun bursts flashed spectacularly. We understood perfectly well that bombers would follow the scouts, and if we met them as delicately, there would be many disasters. A similar merry-go-round was that day over Iranian bomb. It was necessary to take urgent measures. The military council immediately called the commanders of pilots and anti-aircraft gunners. There was a detailed review of all the mistakes made in the reflection of enemy aerial reconnaissance. Fleet commander gave clear instructions and strictly demanded active action. Combat experience what an invaluable force in the war. And if it is not there yet, it is urgent to acquire and accumulate it. So far the score is 1-0 in favour of fascist scouts. But that's for now. A big air battle unfolded over Peterhof. The fascists bombed it for the first time but it did not go in vain. Several bombers found their end in the cold waters of the Gulf of Finland. Analysis of the day's events, especially in connection with enemy air reconnaissance, led us to the conclusion that we should expect bombing raids on Kronstadt, Iranian bomb and Peterhof and after that the enemy's ground forces. Later we received a warning about it from the front headquarters. It was necessary to urgently change the dispositions of ships, but it was very difficult to do. Battleship, cruiser and dozens of other ships cannot be quickly moved from place to place, and even less to hide from observation from the air. And in the evening from the headquarters tower we again saw the flames over Leningrad. Enemy bombers had broken through to the city, but today the fires were dying out much faster than yesterday. Afterwards we learned that extinguishing the fires and helping the wounded that night were much more organised Tens of thousands of Leningraders united in teams of local air defence were involved. We were also glad that the mine laying on the seaside flank of the army, in the Kopo Bay and on the Seskarsky Plies were going on safely, and after all the strengthening of the defence of the approaches to Leningrad from the sea, was entrusted to the fleet as one of the most important tasks. It was only the tenth day since we returned from Tallinn, but it seems as if everything we had experienced was only yesterday, as if on the wall calendar numbers do not change and day does not replace night so grand were the events of that hot period. We still did not have airplanes for aerial reconnaissance of the Gulf of Finland. We decided to send submarines for this purpose. On September 10th, the brigade commander, Captain First Rank NP, Egypko received an urgent task from Conflot to prepare three little ones. For reconnaissance of the area of Tallinn, Helsinki and for actions on communications in the Gulf of Finland, N.P. Egyptco came to see me. We once again clarified the details of the forthcoming departure of the boats. It was decided to escort the submarines to Lavansari Island with a special escort. When returning from the sea they would also be met by surface ships. Thus the experience of sending and meeting submarines, which we had acquired in Moonsund, was now transferred to the Gulf of Finland, to Lavansari Island, which played a very important role in ensuring the actions of the fleet. A complex and responsible business to determine the general courses of deployment of submarines in the new environment of basing the fleet, officers, operators of the fleet staff, submarine commanders and NP. Egyptco himself sat over the maps for hours before they managed to choose the most successful options. We had to analyse in detail all the data about the known mine obstacles and possible new mine laying by the enemy. In the operational zone of the Kronstadt fortress, the intended courses of submarine movement carefully trawled and guarded by sentries. And yet, whatever we were doing in the headquarters, everyone's thoughts were at the walls of Leningrad. Working, we listened sensitively to the cannonade, trying to find at least a distant answer to the most important thing that worried us how things were at the front under the city. And now, after all business matters had been settled, NP Egypt Co. was slow to leave me. We are talking about the situation on the land route. Just reported that the Nazis in the area of Pella threw in the offensive a large mass of infantry and almost 200 tanks armed with flamethrowers. In a narrow area they managed to break through the front of the 42nd Army and advance 10 kilometres. Second separate brigade of marines hastily sent to help the army. In this area are heavy bloody battles. After all, the fascists are rushing to Krasnoy Selo, from which it is a short distance to Leningrad. During our conversation the window panes were shaking. It seemed that they were about to fly out of the frames. Both line ships were firing at the cruiser Kirov. Hit the area of Krasnoy Selo. 
The situation is alarming. I ask Nikolai Pavlovich to carefully monitor that the submarines did not stay long at the base, and after each appearance of enemy reconnaissance aircraft immediately change places. Egypko collected the documents, held out his hand to me and grimly sneered. Yes, business, business. I detained him. Tell me, and how is the mood of the submariners? It happens all the time. On those boats which are preparing for the campaign, the mood of sailors and officers is excellent. Everyone is eager to beat the Nazis at sea, to avenge Leningrad. But those who are on the shore who repair boats are not always happy at heart. The glow of Leningrad's fires can throw anyone off balance. A lot of people have families there. You know what I mean. Egypko left and I thought about his words. Our difficulties and defeats in the first months of the war on the land front, our losses on the sea, all this, of course, affects people. Some of them are out of meridian, as navigators say. Many of them even outwardly became older, sharper in their conversations with comrades. Well, it is understandable. Everything that is happening is too tragic. We are worried for our motherland, for Leningrad, for our families. But we must keep our cool. We had no doubt that our party would save the country, find a way out of the most difficult situation. This gave us strength and persistence in the struggle. Reports from the front came one more bitter than the other. On top of everything, after heavy artillery bombardment of Leningrad, the fascists again made massive air raids on the city. On September 10th, perhaps was the most brutal bombardment of Leningrad, with heavy casualties among the population and major destruction. For many hours the flames of fire were clearly visible in Kronstadt. 69 large high-explosive bombs and about 2,000 incendiary bombs were dropped on the city. In eight districts of the city there were more than 80 fires. Three more Badeyev warehouses burned, but this time without food. A large fire broke out at the Zejdanov shipyard, burning oil factory Red Star. More than 700 Leningraders were killed and wounded. On September 11th in the morning from the reception room came a thick, rolling bus. Is the chief of staff alone? With these words the door opened and the familiar dense figure of General Moskalenko appeared in the office. Mitrofan Ivanovich was gloomy and taciturn. I could see that he too had not slept the night before. He was visibly gaunt. His management of the fleet rear economy became much more complicated because the fleet is located in Leningrad and in Kronstadt. Therefore, there were two rear areas of the fleet, but they were dominated by the rear of the Leningrad front, more and more nailed to their hands all the fleet reserves of food, fuel and ammunition. This was demanded by the interests of the defence of the besieged fortress city, but it was hard for us to get used to it. Apparently, I had a far from Bogotowski, and least of all solemn look, for Mitrofan Ivanovich, having said hello, looking at me point blank, asked me briefly. Is it bad? Of course it would have been possible to interrogate what exactly was bad, but it is clear what in those days could be talked about. I just as briefly answered. Very bad. Moskalenko did not ask about anything else, opened the folder and went on to business. The rear of the Lenfront requires information about all our stocks of food, fuel, ammunition, uniforms and mines. Here are the statements coordinated with the departments of the fleet headquarters. In front of me lay large square sheets. Under them there was room for two signatures, the chief of staff and the head of the rear of the fleet. Now, apparently all consumption of this good will be strictly centralised, and Moskalenko's stocks are still large. They have been accumulating for years in the ancient fleet warehouses and arsenals. Coal is bad, continued the general, although we have considerable reserves but they are stored in the coal harbour of the trade port, and it is now only three kilometres from the front line. The fascists know what coal means to us, and all the time, the bastards, they keep the warehouse under artillery fire. As soon as a small tugboat appears, they open fire. This night, they heavily bombed the harbours of the trade port, and especially the coal harbour, dropped a lot of incendiary bombs. It is good that the head of the site Mamrukov a man energetic. Under his leadership quickly coped with the fire, and the fuel did not die. Report of the head of the rear interrupted the duty officer. He reported the commander of the sentinel hunter reported 
that he was shelled by a battery at Cape Eno. It was not here before. From Levensari we are informed that two Finnish gunboats shelled our communication and observation post on Summers Island. True, our torpedo boats forced the enemy to take cover in the skerries. But anyway, I ordered to inform Captain First Rank Meshchusky about the appearance of the battery on Cape Eno, who with a detachment of ships continued almost daily to place mine barriers in this area. The installations were successful and considerably strengthened the defence of the approaches to Kronstadt and Leningrad during the most terrible September days. The fascists hysterically shouted on the radio that the Baltic fleet no longer existed. And if so far they felt no particular pain from the attacks of our submarines and from the mass mine laying, then more and more headache at Marshal von Lieb from the fire of naval guns and from the fierce attacks of marines. All terms of occupation of Leningrad, appointed by Hitler, turned out to be fake. There was something to rage von Lieb such a delay did not bode well for him. The situation on the Moonsund Islands was becoming more and more complicated. In the next report from General Elisiv reported that the Nazis have gathered a significant force of troops, under the cover of aircraft forced a narrow strait, and on the night of September 13th landed on the island of Muhu. There are bloody battles. The enemy, although suffering heavy losses, but still can still throw reserves, and most importantly he has a strong air force. And we have no reserves. It was hard for us, staff workers, from the consciousness that we could not help the garrisons of the archipelago. Undoubtedly the Germans timed the attack on the islands to the days of the storming of Leningrad. They urgently need to free their divisions in Estonia and throw them under Krasnoi Selo. But the heroic defenders of the islands clung to the German divisions, holding and grinding them down. It became known that the fascists strengthened sea transportation between Tallinn and Helsinki and along the inner scary fairways to Vyborg. Enemy submarines were detected in the area of Nogevo Bank Gogland Island and three patrol boats near Roger Island. Enemy submarines again tried to destroy our observation posts on the islands of Nerva and Summers. The fleet commander decided to send submarines with the task of placing mines on the Tallinn roadstead and in the Bay of Vyborg. On the same day such an order was given to the commander of the submarine brigade, Captain First Rank Egyptko. On September 12th, the submarine M97 was additionally sent for reconnaissance of the Tallinn area. The next day M77 went to the island of Summers. The trip to the Helsinki area was postponed for the time being, as the commanders of the boats M98. And M102, who returned from that area, reported about dense mines, about a large number of floating mines, which they encountered on their way. Komflot that day was returning from Leningrad much earlier than usual. I met him at the headquarters pier in the Italian pond opposite the fleet headquarters and immediately felt something out of the ordinary had happened. Silently and gloomily he stood on the wharf, listening to the reports of the duty service, then quickly went into the office, called me the head of the operational department and the head of the rear. From conversations on the phone with the headquarters of the Naval Defence of Leningrad, we knew that Leningrad is preparing for street battles, the defence of every block, every house. A special organisation, the headquarters of the inner defence of the city, had been created, special units had been allocated. We perceived all this as a logical military necessity, as a precaution. However, the news with which the Komflot arrived was a complete surprise to us. With pencils and workbooks in our hands, we silently prepared to write down orders. After giving us a glance, the Vice Admiral said, The situation at the front is critical. There are fierce fighting. We will defend Leningrad to the last possible opportunity. But everything is possible. In case the fascists break through to the city, at the enterprises and military facilities created Troika, to destroy everything that can seize the enemy. All bridges, factories, enterprises will be mined. If the enemy breaks into the city, he will die under its ruins. There was a long, agonising pause. Komflot wiped his sweating forehead and continued. Stavka requires that not a single ship, not a single warehouse with property, not a single gun in Kronstadt did not get to the enemy. If the situation requires, everything must be destroyed. Staff and rear of the fleet to urgently make a plan of mind every ship, fort, warehouse. People before the explosion will be taken ashore, formed into detachments and sent to the front. 
I warn you, Comflot frowned his eyebrows. Only the direct executors can know about this decision. Is it clear? Nobody asked any questions. And what was there to ask? We were stunned at first. There were all sorts of unhappy thoughts going through our heads. That's where the full force of our political work was needed. And it made itself known. Military commander of the headquarters LV, Serebrenikov summoned the communists of the departments, which one way or another were involved in the development of this terrible plan. And as much as each of us was bitter, still took the upper hand consciousness that to fulfill the order of the Stavka, it is our duty as communists. The commanders of compounds with military commissars were called. All sorts of details of the upcoming case were clarified. The required amount of explosives was calculated. The plan of arrangement of ships on the fairways was established and in what order the crews would be delivered to the shore. It was important to select the executors especially restrained, reliable communists in whose hands were handed the switches of closing special wires. It was necessary to take all measures to avoid accidents that could lead to a catastrophe. The least of all we were worried about malice, for the huge party organisation of the fleet was too strong and united, but vigilance, the strictest vigilance that was what was required of every communist. In the evening, when the materials were being rewritten by the typists and there was an involuntary pause, the chief of the rear Mitrofan Ivanovich Moskalenko came to see me. As was his habit, he sat down thoroughly and tightly in his chair, pushed away the ashtray, rolls of maps and began to look around the office with a masterly eye, waiting for me to finish talking on the phone. Tell them to throw out that old couch. It's a hundred years old, and it's only good for the dump he muttered. He muttered. Such a remark, against the background of the tragic events we were living through, made me smile. I understood Mitrofan Ivanovich realised with the instinct of an old political officer that some kind of relaxation was needed. And in such tragic moments we suddenly began to discuss what repairs the headquarters building would need after the war. At the same time it was hard to get rid of the thought, what if tomorrow afternoon we blow up our entire headquarters and it falls to pieces along with all its old furniture? What kind of repairs would be needed then? But I kept silent. Soon the typists brought the first sheets of the plan, and we began to carefully proofread them, saying aloud words completely unfamiliar to the operational and tactical vocabulary exploded, destroyed, set on fire. Leaving, Mitrofan Ivanovich muttered with a heavy sigh. Yes, what a lot of business. Barely dawned on September 12th, as the fleet received requests from the land route to fire battleships, cruisers, coastal batteries, Fortress Kronstadt and the ships conducted a continuous, ever-increasing fire. No thought was given to ammunition consumption on that day. General Moskalenko, alarmed by the unusual rumble of the cannonade, came to me early and anxiously asked, What about ammunition consumption? Or do you at headquarters think that I have a full stockpile of artillery? I could not answer anything, because we were also worried about it. I hurriedly contacted the headquarters of the Sea Defence in Leningrad. It was closer to the headquarters of the Len Front and more visible there. They answered briefly everything was at stake, and nobody was interested in the issue of ammunition consumption rates today. From six o'clock in the morning, the fascists began to attack along the whole front. Hitler, in the order to his troops, stated that with the capture of Leningrad will end the war. Significant advantage of the enemy in tanks, artillery and aviation affected all parts of the front. That's why in these hours so needed the fire of the fleet, all its ships, batteries of the fortress and railroad artillery. And the fleet crushed the enemy, supporting his army. Still we left Dudahoff Heights an important command position on the approaches to the city. The enemy occupied Pushkin and Krasnoy Selo. Polkovsky Heights are held. Here one of the sites heroically defended by the first separate brigade of marines under the command of Colonel Parafilo, who became famous under Tallinn. Having left Vasilyevsky Island, the brigade entered the battle from the start and fought for three days in a row. At the most tense moment among the Baltic sailors appeared the famous hero of the Civil War, Marshal K. E. Voroshilov. This further encouraged the sailors. They repulsed dozens of attacks, but there were no reserves, and the inevitable happened on September 13th, 
our front was broken at Ligovo. Now there was an immediate threat to Leningrad. The Nazis are in 14 kilometers from the city. Blood ran cold in our veins at this thought, and only the powerful rumble of the fleet's cannonade encouraged us a little, reminding us that there was still powder in the powder keg. Of course, everything was thrown to help the front our fleet aviation, bombers, fighters, even Sea Scouts slow moving ICBM 2s and those continuously bombed fascist troops, helping infantrymen to repel countless attacks. The Finns managed to force the Svar, capture the village of Podporozhai, and then the town of Lodinoi Pole. And in this area, our fleet helped their army. Shoulder to shoulder with the fighters of the 7th Army fought desperately, there is no other word for it. The sailors of the 3rd Separate Naval Brigade fought. Late in the evening came Elisiv's report. On the night of September 13th, after heavy bloody fighting, ours left the island of Muhu and on the Orissa Dam withdrew to Easel. The enemy stormed the island after them and rushed to Triji Bay to the north and to Kubasau to the south. The Nazis decided to support their troops on Easel with landing operations, remembering perhaps 1917, when the Germans conducted a landing operation against the Moonsund Islands, defended by revolutionary Baltic sailors. But then, having landed in Targalakt Bay, the enemy moved from west to east. And now the fascists formed three detachments of landing ships. One of them Westwind went from Libava to act in the southwestern part of Easel. The Zuidveind group moved from Riga and Panu to the southern part of the island. Against the island of Huma was to act the detachment Nordwind, which consisted of ships of the Finnish Navy battleships Coastal Defence Ilmarinen, and Veinemainen, four patrol boats, five patrol ships, one minesweeper and one icebreaker. This detachment was deployed from the UT Skerries area. General Elisiv reported that in the afternoon of September 13th, our aviation detected a detachment of ships Westwind, consisting of six small transports with a landing force in the guard of small ships. The detachment was on its way to the Bay of Lu, which is located in the southwestern part of the island of Easel. By this time here was relocated a link of our torpedo boats, under the command of Lieutenant Captain S. A. Osipov. A. Osipov. At 19 o'clock boats rushed to the attack, Three ships with the landing party were sunk. The guard ships had to rescue their drowning soldiers. Despite the hurricane fire of the enemy, our boats returned to their base Mintu without losses and damage. The actions of the boats were successfully covered by fighters and the fire of the coastal defence battery from the Serve Peninsula. Our gunners sank one more transport. Hitlerites promptly fled this, of course, was our great success. The defenders of the island rejoiced. The military council of the fleet immediately sent greetings and congratulations. All night we joyfully discussed in the headquarters of this victory. On September 14th, from the morning, the fleet and the batteries of Kronstadt again fired on the southern shore. Still the enemy managed to advance, to occupy Ligovo, Strelna and New Peterhof. The sea channel, the only way on which large warships could go between Leningrad and Kronstadt, was now already seen by the Nazis a new complication was created for us. In this situation, the fleet headquarters received an urgent task to prepare for transportation to the Leningrad front of two infantry divisions of the 8th Army from Oranienbaum, immediately began to form a special group of ships. In normal conditions, this task is not difficult, but now it was more than difficult. Large ships in the narrow sea canal could go only at low speed. They had no freedom of maneuver, moving straight linear course. They would be perfect targets for enemy artillery stationed in Ligov and Peterhof, and even more so for enemy aviation. Therefore, it was necessary to have shallow sitting and fast propelled warships, capable of sailing in the bay outside the encircled part of the canal, gunboats, minesweepers, patrol boats and barges with sea tugs. Of course, these are small ships, and they required a large number of them. In addition, to collect them in one place was dangerous, because of the often recurring air raids of the enemy. All this armada had to be kept dispersed, but so that at any moment to feed them to the piers of Iranian bomb for landing troops. It was a joy to observe with what enthusiasm the commanders of the headquarters and rear took up the work in each report, sounded the desire to prepare transportation faster and better, to do everything in our power to defeat the enemy. Together with the head of the rear MI, 
Moskalenko and the head of the Navy Voso I. N. Guntsov we went to Iranian bomb, outlined the berths for loading troops, rearranged the ships in the harbour so that they could quickly manoeuvre when mooring. Late in the evening came a report from the island of Ezel. Having been defeated in the Bay of Lu, the Nazis at dawn put into action their second detachment Zudwind. Five ships began to bombard the town of Kiresa and the island of Abruk. Meanwhile, the landing party, which followed on small ships in the protection of destroyers and patrol ships, tried to land in the Bay Kigusta. In the rear of the battery on the Kubasa Peninsula was delivered in gliders more than a hundred machine gunners. The battery was commanded by Senior Lieutenant Bukotkin. The artillerymen showed exceptional bravery and skill. Excellent firing, the battery defeated the landing party on the water. Its remnants under the smoke screens withdrew to the south. The battery on a Brook Island also fired well and drove away the enemy covering detachment. The enemy began furiously bombing Bukotkin's battery from the air. For several hours, the fascist pilots dropped more than 400 bombs. They were killed and wounded, the guns were out of order, and meanwhile parachutists and enemy infantry from the mainland were climbing to the surviving guns. The battery commander Bukotkin was wounded gradually, the guns went out of service. When the ammunition ran out, the sailors blew up the last gun and broke through under fire to their units. The heroic battery was covered by fighters, but they were so few. Pilot Captain I. I, Gorbachev, fought repeated battles with Nazi main 109 planes that day, driving them away from the island. He managed to shoot down an enemy airplane. The third enemy detachment, Nordwind, was also defeated. As already mentioned, this detachment consisted of ships of the Finnish fleet. According to information that we later received, the Finns did not want to participate in the operation. Under pressure from the Germans, they agreed only to demonstrative actions. But when leaving the Skerries, the battleship Ilmarinen exploded on a mine and sank. The detachment still approached the island of Hyuma, made a few volleys, and immediately turned back to the island of Ute. This was the end of the whole operation. On the fairway near Ute, we repeatedly put mines from torpedo boats and airplanes in August. Apparently, the Finnish battleship exploded on one of these mines. Strange as it may seem, but the fact of its destruction was very quickly reported to us from the main naval headquarters pilots and gunboat crews argued about who had laid this mine. But this dispute did not matter. The mine was ours, Baltic, and it worked well. But the situation on Easel remained difficult. By the end of the day, the enemy pulled up fresh forces from the mainland and launched a new offensive. Our garrison, in order to reduce the front, withdrew to the Sirv Peninsula, where General Elisiv decided to defend until the last opportunity. Without tanks, and with little small artillery, without air cover, the Baltic stubbornly defended every inch of land. Again and again we thought how to help our comrades. And it was possible to help them only by strong air strikes and airborne assaults. We discussed this option in the headquarters more than once. Comflot reported our proposals to the military council of the front, but where could we get forces? After all, the deadly battle was rumbling at the very walls of Leningrad. Here the question was decided who was who. The record in my diary about the next 24 hours is very short September 15th, was the hardest day of the battle for Leningrad. The enemy threw everything to break through to the city. He conducted the most intense shelling of residential neighbourhoods for 18 and a half hours. At dusk began raids of 200 bombers. Our fighters were continuously in the air, fought brave battles. A lot of fascist planes were shot down that day, but unfortunately even more of them remained in the line. All day long there was not silent the formidable roar of the fleet's guns. And yet the fascists approached the city at a distance of 10 kilometres. As reported to me by the commanders of the ships that stood in the area of the trade port, from the bridges in binoculars and stereo tubes were clearly visible enemy tanks. The head of the political department of the fleet, Divisional Commissar VP. Lebedev came to me several times during the day and told me how heroically our sailors were fighting everywhere, both on shore and on ships, how persistently our heroic pilots were attacking the fascists, and how many applications had been submitted on that hard day from people who had distinguished themselves in battles, asking to be accepted into the party. Even if I have to die, I want to be a communist. One way or another, but this thought was expressed by many thousands of fighters. 
VP, Lebedev an experienced, educated political worker. In these critical days, he always brought to the headquarters some encouraging news that strengthened the strength of the people's spirit. He told us that in the Oritsky Palace, the City Komsomol Committee held a city youth rally with the participation of 3,000 young patriots. Under enemy shelling, the Komsomol members took an oath to be loyal to the motherland until their last breath. In the Smolny gathered party activists of the city, discussed matters related to the defence of Leningrad. All this is evidence of confidence, lack of even a hint of confusion or panic. The party led people to defeat the enemy. On all the ships and in the units was adopted an appeal of the Baltic to the Leningraders. The letter said, We give you a sacred, unbreakable oath, as long as the heart beats, as long as the eyes see, as long as the hands hold weapons, there will be no fascist scum in the city of Lenin. We'll fight for Leningrad, to the last drop of blood, to the last breath. And the fleet fought. The words of the oath became our sacred motto. Telephone communication between Kronstadt and Leningrad was broken time and again due to shelling damage of cables and wires within the city. Our communicators quickly eliminated the breaks. These telephone pauses were not particularly long, but they often seemed like an eternity, because at such a time dry laconic texts of radiograms and telegraph tapes could not replace the living word. Late in the evening we received an order to start urgent transportation of two divisions of the 8th Army from Iranian Bomb to Leningrad, for which we had already prepared. Apparently, it was not easy for the Germans at Leningrad if they missed this very important for the defence of the city transfer of troops. On the second day of transportation, September 17th, the Nazis made the first artillery bombardment of Iranian Bomb port, but rather haphazardly, the troops were sheltered and suffered no losses. On September 19th, having regained consciousness, the Nazis began methodical shelling of Iranian bomb harbours. Too late. A day before both divisions were already in Leningrad. The enemy fired at the empty harbours, did some damage, burned a few barns. But all this was nothing. I remember with what a happy feeling I sent a report to the front headquarters the last division unit left Iranian bomb. In such a big business as the defence of the city, it was not without serious omissions, which the military council of the front saw and sought to correct more quickly. We, sailors, had our own complaints. Often in the midst of battles, army artillery chiefs demanded from the fleet to fire powerful guns on unimportant targets, which could successfully cope with and army guns, much smaller calibre. Meanwhile, the barrels of large guns of cruisers and battleships are designed only for a certain number of shots, after which the barrels must be replaced. And it could happen that at the most crucial moment of the battle the ships would be out of action. This reasonable concern of the military council of the fleet has repeatedly expressed to the front command. However, in those hot, tense days, when the enemy broke through to the very walls of the city, it was difficult to argue and prove something. The danger was too great to reckon with the wear and tear of naval guns. But soon our voice was listened to and established a new order in which to call fire, could only the chief of artillery of the fleet, General Odintsov. Military Council of the Fleet has repeatedly reported on the weakness of our aerial reconnaissance in the sea direction, and now the fleet was allocated for this purpose a squadron of airplanes DB-3, which was immediately reported to us by the commander of naval aviation, General M. I. Samokin, to strengthen the artillery of the Leningrad group of ships in the Neva, entered the leader Leningrad and three destroyers. Four gunboats moved to the Peterhof roadstead and the battleship October Revolution. And one destroyer took positions in the unfenced part of the sea canal against Strelna and Peterhof. One destroyer remained in position in the Iranian Barmeam area. This deployment of artillery ships made it possible to better organise the fire of the fleet to repel direct attacks of the Nazis on Leningrad. The Germans must have appreciated the role of the Baltic fleet, its assistance to the army defending the city. The fleet, about the destruction of which they trumpeted on the radio, in fact lived and acted. The fascists felt the fire of two line ships, three cruisers, a dozen destroyers and coastal batteries on their own skin. And Hitlerites had to fight again with the fleet, destroyed in Tallinn. Since September 16th, 
the fascists began to shell and bomb our ships in harbours and on raids. This meant that dozens of fascist guns turned their mouths away from Leningrad, and hundreds of bombs did not fall on its residential buildings. The first 150mm shells of the Nazis that day fell on the decks of the battleship Marat and the cruiser Petropavlovsky. Both ships were standing in the sea canal and since morning were firing at the enemy infantry in the area of Ligovo. The ships were not significantly damaged, their artillery did not stop firing for a minute. The enemy then became quite furious and threw dive bombers at the battleship. The battleship went along the channel, continuously fired from the main calibre of the enemy infantry and anti-aircraft fire drove away the attacking planes. We stood on the staff tower and watched with bated breath as fascist dive bombers swirled over the battleship as bombs fell and high columns of water rose around the ship. Suddenly flames flashed, two bombs fell on the deck. The ship did not slow down, did not stop firing. As a result of direct hit of bombs on the battleship were killed and wounded, 120mm gun was out of service. The fire was quickly extinguished. Just in case, two strong sea tugs went out to meet the battleship, for on the narrow fairway he had no freedom of manoeuvre. But the commander of the battleship captain first rank Ivanov managed the ship perfectly and brought it safely to the Kronstadt roadstead. We realised that the enemy would not leave our ships alone now. Komflot called the commanders of anti-aircraft units, explained the situation and warned that we should prepare for a serious fight with aviation, defending the fleet and the fortress from the air. It was a hard day, but it ended with great joy for us. We were even afraid to talk about it loudly, but everyone in the headquarters smiled. Late in the evening, Rear Admiral VP. Drozd came to see me. Hard, as if the Germans began to entrench. I replied with a smile. It seems so, but we must still check. Valentin Petrovich's face shone. I am convinced of this, and therefore this time I wish you good night. The news, unconfirmed by anyone, had spread through the headquarters. The heads of departments tried to find an excuse to come to me and talk about it. But I kept silent, afraid to be deceived in what we all waited so long. And yet it felt like the beginning of a turning point. The crisis had passed. The enemy offensive was running out of steam. Having smashed his forehead against the walls of the hero city, he began to entrench himself. Let only in some parts of the city, 